how do you stack the odds in your favor to have a successful and happy and truly abundant life? And he said to me this thing that I mentioned in the epilogue of the book. And so I started to think, okay, if I'm going to realign myself, reboot my life, where have I been going wrong? What have I been not focusing on? What should we learn from Munger and Buffett? What do we want to clone? Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Broderson. And today I'm here with my co-host, William Green. How are you today, William? I'm delighted to be here with you. So, William, the format of this episode will be a little different than what we usually do. Usually, as you know, we have an interview and a guest, but rarely two hosts. So we have that going for us here today. But William, you're here today partly as a co-host, but also as a guest. Because whenever I think about you, William, and how you live your life, I really see you as an example to follow for everyone in our community. And the intention of this episode is that we, together with the audience, can live a richer, wiser, and happier life. So it's going to be no small feat here going into this episode. Ah. If I can just kick this off, I'd say that one of the things I admire most about you is your integrity. Uh, and then, of course, we can go in and define what is integrity. So I'm just going to I'm going to try and define it here. I've seen, or at least I've seen integrity be defined as the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. So having said all of that, William, I want to kick this episode off by asking you whether you agree or disagree with the premise of the question. And if you do agree, how would you design a life where you can live with integrity? Thanks, Nick. I think you may have a much more charitable view of me than is deserved, but I'll take it. I appreciate your kind version of what I'm like. You don't see me when I'm at my worst. But um, it's certainly the case that I, well, A, I would say I do plenty of stuff that I'm not proud of and that I am somewhat ashamed of and that I wouldn't want people to see. And I think about this a lot because when I interview people, there's a tendency to kind of lionize people and assume that they're all kind of perfect and they're better than us. And, you know, they are better than us in certain ways. I mean, everyone has some qualities that are really extraordinary. But what I find again and again is they're all flawed. They all do stuff that, you know, where they get angry in certain situations or they're jealous or they're vain or whatever, you know, like we're all deeply flawed. And that's been really helpful to me, actually, to realize that we're all imperfect. So then when I see my own imperfections, I try not to get too depressed about it because I see this gap between the way I talk and what I want to be and what I aspire to be and my actual behavior some of the time. And then you start to feel like a, a hypocrite and you start to feel kind of, you know, down on yourself and a little ashamed and guilty and embarrassed. And I'm not sure that's a very helpful place to come from. So I try not to have a kind of infinite capacity for guilt. And I try not to go there too much increasingly because I think it's better just to try to say, let me try to be kinder and more decent and more loving and more truthful. I'm pretty obsessed with David Hawkins. As you know, you very kindly sent me one of his books signed by him. And Hawkins has this very interesting scale. If you look at a book like Power Versus Force, which I was introduced to by Monish Pabrai, Hawkins has this scale where you can calibrate certain behavior and certain virtues and things like shame and guilt calibrate incredibly low, whereas things like compassion, kindness, love, mercy, truthfulness really calibrate very high. And so what I kind of thought was, this is my interpretation of it, and I never really know what to make of Hawkins scale at all. I just thought if I can try to flood the zone with trying to be kinder and more decent and more compassionate, maybe that will make up for some of the ways in which I don't behave that well. And, and there's a beautiful line from Hawkins that I have on a card, um, blue tack to my wall next to my study, which says something like simple kindness to oneself and all that lives is the most transformational force of all. And I come back to that again and again, as a kind of North star thinking, okay, so so yeah, there are all of these ways in which I wish I were better. I wish I behaved better. Um, I wish I were kind of less, less flawed, but at least let me try to show simple kindness to others. But then also that's really curious, that quote in that it says simple kindness to oneself and all that lives is the most transformational force of all. So I take that as being, 
we should also be sort of compassionate to ourselves when we behave in ways that we think are not that great. And so it's not about giving yourself a total carte blanche and saying, I can do whatever I want because I'm just going to be forgiven and, and it's fine and I shouldn't be ashamed of anything or guilty about anything. But I think coming from that place of thinking, yeah, we're all pretty flawed. We all do lousy stuff. But let me at least come back to this true north of trying to be kinder. And I think because I'm kind of confused by the world, because everything is so complex and my mind is kind of all over the place, that idea of simply trying to be kinder, of having that as a true north, has actually been incredibly helpful to me. And so I try to be more truthful and stuff. I try to have more integrity. And, you know, as Tom Gaynor would say, you know, I'm probably directionally correct. I'm probably getting better. But I feel like if I'm kinder, consistently kinder, that covers a lot of flaws. And so that, that to me has really become the guiding principle. And I fail on that front as well, constantly, especially when I'm stressed or it's hard to behave uh, very thoughtfully and kindly when you're stressed. But again, I think I've been directionally correct. And I, I'm not saying that in a self-congratulatory way. I think actually partly I've been directionally correct because I understood this simple idea. And it, it goes back to Charlie Munger saying, take a simple idea and take it seriously. And this is something, again, that I learned from Monish is when you discover a principle that you think is true, you really want to go a thousand percent on it, as Monish would say. So Monish discovered the power of things like compounding or cloning, which he'll define as just looking at the things that other people who are smarter and wiser than us do, and then replicating them with this ferocious attention to detail. And he took things like that incredibly seriously. Likewise, when he read Power versus Force, he decided, I'm going to be more truthful because if you're truthful, you calibrate higher and you're more powerful. People sense whether you're lying or whether you're being truthful. So he just decided, I'm simply not going to lie. I'm just going to be truthful. And so for me, the really simple idea that I tried to internalize is, I'm going to try to be kinder. That's wonderful. William, I wanted to just provide one comment to to what you said about Manis and the whole thing about not lying. And I'm definitely guilty in charge. And I guess everyone listening to this have lied at some point in time in, in their life. And I just, I can't remember where I read it, but someone wrote that one of the benefits of always telling the truth is that you don't have to remember what the lie was and who you lied to. And I don't know if this comes across as me being very untruthful whenever I was younger, but it, it actually made a huge impact on me. It's such, a, it's such a stress reliever that if you tell the truth, and again, the tr telling the truth also comes with a lot of stress, so please do not get me wrong. But this entire mindset of if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember like who knows what and who do they know. And like, it's so liberating in its own way. It's, it's liberating and really scary. So if you think about it, we start this interview and it's a little bit like I remember as a teenager going to meet some girl I was dating at the time and being like, I'm not going to say this because I know if I'm angry like this, it's just going to blow up the whole relationship. And then, of course, you immediately say the thing that you weren't intending to say. So I come into this conversation and I'm like, I'm immediately telling you that I behave in ways that I'm kind of ashamed of and that are shameful. And, that I, you know, and there's a part of you that's like, oh, my God, this stuff that I should be concealing from the world is now out there front and center. And that's kind of terrifying in some ways. And at the same time, really liberating. And I was really struck when I went to Omaha last time for the Berkshire meeting, the, the guy whose name I'm spacing on, who um, uh, handles the insurance portfolio, you know who I mean, the legendary uh, guy. Aji Jane. Aji Jane, who's added something like $50 billion of value or something out, outrageous. He's given his moment in the spotlight. And so he comes out. Buffett and Munger asking questions. And as I remember it, Ajit Jain is given his first opportunity to answer a question. And the very first thing he does is tell you how Geico is underperforming, how they're worse than their biggest rival. And it was just an amazing thing to see that culture where instead of coming out and telling you how wonderful they are, they come out and tell you the thing that they could easily be concealing. And it was one of those things where I thought, they, they've so deeply internalized that as part of their culture, not concealing the things that are wrong, but, you know, not, 
I mean, as Charlie always says, they're rubbing their nose in their mistakes. That's an amazing quality to have. And so, I don't know, you don't want to be self-flagellating about these things, I think. But the relief of not hiding the stuff that's a little bit tawdry or unpleasant or unflattering, there is something very liberating and at the same time scary. Yeah. So just one quick thing about me, because I don't know how interesting this is for the audience, but just one thing I thought of in the whole living with honesty. So one thing I struggled with whenever I was younger, uh, let's say early 20s, that there are a lot of different social events that I don't like, like um, weddings or, you know, 50th birthdays and anniversaries and baptism, like a bunch of different things. And whenever I got invited to those things, I went there because, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. And I didn't like it. It wasn't like I had anxiety and really disliked. It was just more like, you know, I kind of felt, why am I doing this? I don't really speak to the host because that's the only person you're not speaking to whenever you have these kind of events because there are so many. You get to sit like six hours next to a person you're never going to see again. Like so For me, like doing all of that really just didn't make any sense. And so what I've started doing was I said to the wonderful host who invited me to whatever the event was, said, I don't want to. I don't enjoy those type of events. But, you know, I'm going to bring a pizza and a six pack and I'm going to come the following Tuesday because I want to hang out with you. I want to have a conversation with you. It's not you I'm saying no to. It, it's the actual event. And uh, to me, it almost gave me excited doing that to begin with. Because I was like, the person is probably going, going to be angry at me. But what happened was that the person was like, oh, yeah, that probably makes sense. Yeah, I would love to see you next Tuesday. Let's have pizza and beer. And, you know, it, it was just one of those things. And I know this is just a small thing in the bigger thing that we were talking about today. It's been so liberating that I don't need to have any kind of anxiety by telling that to someone now or like the weeks leading up to an event, I can just not go, but still want to be very sincere in the relationship with that person. It's a beautiful insight. And it's related to something that happened when I was interviewing Bill Miller, at his home in the outskirts of Baltimore, where for my book, Richard, Wise are happier? I spent probably two days interviewing Bill and I, I've interviewed him probably 80, 90, 100 hours of the last 22 years. So we've got to know each other really pretty well over the years. And there was one point where we were talking about how he lives these days and how authentically he lives. And he said when he was invited to be a keynote speaker at some event, some big gala event, he said, well, what's the dress code? And they said, black tie, you'll have to wear a tuxedo. And he's like, no, I threw out my tuxedo and I'm never going to buy another one. And there was something really wonderful to me about the fact that Bill had become so aligned with his own nature that he'd got to a point where he knew what he was like. He knows what interests him. He knows what he's best at. And he structured his life really in a way that reflects his own nature and his own preferences, his own interests, his own talents. And one of the issues with this that I'm sure our listeners will be cottoning on to immediately is the fact that you can be a little bit of a sociopath, right? I mean, you can start to say things that you shouldn't say or that are unkind. And I do think that's a risk. And I think Bill happens to be a, a really good and decent and kind person, but I think he knows himself well enough that he's structured his life in this very aligned and authentic way. And I see the same thing with Monish. And I, I wrote about this a lot in my chapter about Monish because Monish doesn't really care about fitting in with social norms, right? So he's structured this incredibly aligned life where he'll, um, I remember, for example, it sounds like a really ridiculous thing, but he talked about how he would take a guilt-free nap in the afternoons. Whereas I sometimes take a nap in the afternoon, it's literally for like about seven minutes, but I tend to feel guilt about it. But Monish is like, no, this is how I like to live my life. And he dresses in shorts and a t-shirt or whatever when he's coming in and into the office. And he won't have meetings with his shareholders. And he won't market the fund because he says, uh, yeah, I don't like all of the mumbo jumbo of marketing. And I think there's something kind of wonderful about that. But there's an issue with it as well, right? Which is, it helps to be rich, right? I mean, if yeah. you have the money, you can structure your life in a way that's very true to who you are. 
But I think that is true. And at the same time, for me, it's been very powerful to know that this is a goal, to know that I want to structure my life in a way that's true and authentic to who I am. And what, one of the aspects of that is that I figured out over the last few years that I'm not really optimizing for money. That's just not the thing I'm most obsessed with. It matters much more to me who I'm working with, whether they're decent, whether they're kind, whether they're honest, whether they're caring, whether they're sharing, what they're trying to do with their work, whether it's just about you know their own ego or whether there's actually something kind of a little more altruistic and decent about it. And that's idiosyncratic, right? That I care that much about that. But it just happens to be where I'm coming from. And that's been a really wonderful thing. Like at a certain point, I just decided I'm not going to work with anybody that I dislike ever. And maybe that was inspired by Monish. There, there was a time where I was, I was working on a project with someone who I thought was kind of really unpleasant and started to threaten me in certain ways. I, as you know, I'm always late with everything with deadlines and the like, partly because I'm sort of obsessed with trying to get things as good as possible, partly because I'm scrambling with too many things and I'm not very, not very good at managing my time and productivity and the like. And this guy started to threaten me and say, well, if you don't meet the deadline, I can sue you. And I just, I was working so unbelievably hard to do something that was kind of beautiful and good. And I was doing things that I think from his perspective, he didn't know how hard they were to do and how extraordinary it was that we were pulling off these things that were kind of really difficult. And then the guy starts to threaten me. And Monish said to me, if you had more money, you just would have sworn at him and walked away. And I couldn't really do it. And I never want to get in that situation again where uh, and that's really important to me. It's hugely important to me. So I'm not saying any of this in a sort of totally self-congratulatory way. I think if there's a takeaway, it's that you just want to be asking yourself what you're really optimizing for. What do you really care about? What actually makes for a rich and abundant life for you? And for me, spending time working with extraordinary people who I like and doing work that's fulfilling and that I think has some sort of higher purpose that's helpful in some way, just happens to be fulfilling. And I think earlier in my life, my desires were just very different, right? I mean, I'm 54 now, so I spent a lot of time as a journalist, probably 20 something years working at magazines and the like. And I just was desperate for people to see how smart I was and how good I was at what I did. And there was a lot of I mean, I still have plenty of ego, but I was really driven by this pretty fragile need to get ahead, to be recognized, to climb the ladder, to, and I, maybe it just changes as you get older. I'm not so motivated by that stuff anymore. You know, I, I think to some, it changes whenever they get older and to others, it's not. I, I remember uh, Preston and I reading the book by T. Boone Piggins. And the title of the book was The First Billion is the Hardest. So you just get it there from that. And so I remember the first time you told me that story. This was probably more than a year ago. You told me this story about this person who threatened to sue you. And it also made an impact on me. I know we talked about it a few times since because it's so telling of the way that both of us want to live our, our life. And so whenever I read T. Boone Piggins' book, what stood out to me was just how different he, he saw the world which sort of like goes into a philosophical question of, is it because I'm seeing the world all wrong? Because like to T-Bone Piggins, it seemed like everyone was his enemy. And it's almost like, well, I wouldn't say T-Bone Piggins and Carl Icahn would be the same person, but the type of person who would, you know, make a living out of, um, he's not making friends, he's defeating his enemy. And that was how he saw life and work. Um, and to me, that it, it just seems like it, terrible way of living a life but it, which again is like they might be looking at us William and, and saying I have a billion dollars so yeah. <laughs> why do I care and it's fun defeating enemies whereas I might be living a life where I just don't want to have enemies and perhaps that's I don't know that's bad I, I don't know I spent a lot of time with a 
multi-billionaire in the UK who I, I worked on a project with many years ago. And so I got to know him a lot. And he used to talk about poor rich people. And so he obviously knew an enormous number of the richest people in the world. He at one point owned the most expensive house in the world himself. And he was a very remarkable self-made guy, very brilliant. And I thought that was really interesting, the idea of poor rich people. And he felt that he was surrounded by them, these people who seemed rich, but in some way they were internally poor. It's a very, very interesting concept. And I don't know, it's complicated because I remember uh, years and years ago, I took a flight with Monish and Guy Spear, who were very, very close friends and both close friends of mine. And we were flying back from Omaha and they just had the Sunday brunch with Buffett and Munger. So they were both sort of high, like they were just really excited on top of the world. And Guy had rented a NetJet plane, which, you know, I've never seen him do another time. I'm sure he's done it other times. And so I was flying back with them in this sort of luxurious way. And we spent most of that flight talking about the inner scorecard and th this concept of Buffett. So you want to live by an inner scorecard and not really care how other people live, how other people judge you. You're living by your own standards. And Monish's view was that if you're a sociopath, you should basically live that way. He was talking at the time about Putin. He was like, you know, Putin's a sociopath. He should live in alignment with who he is. And Guy's view, of course, is very different than that. Guy's right. like, you know, no, you should behave decently and honorably and tra transform the way you behave. It's a complex one, right? Because you want to you wanna behave in a way that's aligned with your true nature. But what if your nature is kind of lousy? Yeah. And so it's difficult. Like, I, I have my own set of prejudices here, but there are certain things I'm prepared to sacrifice in order to live in a way that I want to live. And so I'm very happy to walk away from money, but I couldn't, that's partly because I got to a point where I was comfortable enough and secure enough that I could do it. And I think part of what was really painful for me, you know, I went through a difficult period, as you know, where I'd been editing the international editions of Time magazine. And then during the financial crisis, I got laid off and I had very high expenses because I was living in in London in this beautiful house that was paid for by time. And they sent my kids to a lovely private school. And then suddenly it's like, oh my God, I was sort of cast out of the kingdom, out of this job that I really loved. And my profession was falling apart. Journalism was going through a terrible period. And I remember thinking at the time, I, I started to do some work that I really didn't like. I, I mean, for one thing, I took, I, I was very lucky. I got a job, a, a decent paying and decent job, but at a company that I disliked intensely. And I quit that job and walked away with two kids in private school and these very high expenses. And that was scary as hell. But part of it, so I, I really felt that intense pressure between the practicalities of needing to do certain work just because you've got to support your family and the desire to live in a way that was aligned with who I am. And I worked for people I regarded as slightly dishonest and slightly, mm. they were bullies, I thought. And they, I'm not trying to be sort of super judgmental of them. They had an ultimate boss who was a bully. And I think it was almost like an abused family. And so people who were hurt and scared themselves would then behave not so well with their underlings. And I may be wrong about this, or it may be unfair, but it was certainly the wrong environment for me. And so I had this kind of crisis where I remember thinking, well, my family had fled from Ukraine and Russia and Poland in the first part of the 20th century as Jews in places where there were pogroms and there was a lot of persecution. And they didn't have it easy. It was hard. And I remember just thinking, maybe there are certain times in your life, maybe your entire life where you just capitulate and you just, you uh, capitulate's the wrong word, maybe, but it felt like capitulation to me, where I just accept the fact that I have to do what it takes. I've got to do work that I don't like, that doesn't have any higher purpose at all. And that's just what you do to take care of your family. And I really thought about World War II and these periods where you just had to do what you had to do for your family. 
And it was kind of crushing. I mean, to think, wow, this, this, this just may be my fate. And I remember a friend of mine saying, you know, look, not everyone gets to live the dream. And it was very painful. It really felt like a kind of capitulation. And then at some point I was like, no, I'm not doing that. I just kept doubling down on the things that I actually found fulfilling, like writing books. And part of what happened is I started to work with Guy Spear on his book, The Education of a Value Investor. And then I started to work on other books like The Great Minds of Investing. And then that led to my book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. And so it set me on this amazing trajectory. But it was scary. And I really felt that tension. So between the desire to live a life that's aligned with who you are and the pressure to make a living and take care of your family. And it's not easy having felt that tension. But I have to say, when I look back, I'm just so immensely relieved that I took the path of living in a way that's truer to who I am. And I think about this a lot with my kids, right? I have a 21-year-old daughter, Madeline, and a 24-year-old son, Henry. And I'm off, they're both very creative. And I think they both want to be musicians and writers and the like. And these are not known as the most secure, stable professions, right? You want your kid to be a hedge fund manager or an investment banker or something, I guess. You know, you want them to be secure. And I'm like, no, no, buy the lottery ticket. Because you don't want to look back at the end of your life and think, I didn't take the risk of living in a way that's aligned with who I am. And so I worked with Tony Robbins on some things along the way. And so I got to know Tony fairly well. And I, I remember Tony saying at one point, um, talking about how you define what a beautiful life is for you. And I remember him saying at some point, well, so for someone, it's going to be having a spouse and two kids. For somebody, it's going to be having a beautiful garden. And I remember him sort of adding at the end of this list saying, and for some people, it's to get closer to their God. And I just thought that was a really, really interesting discussion because you realize just how idiosyncratic and personal your definition of what a good life is, what a fulfilled life is, what's truly aligned. And so the, none of these questions are easy and they're extremely personal and idiosyncratic. But for the, the people who are listening, who are kind of teetering on the edge, deciding how should I live my life? I would just encourage you to push towards living a life that's deeply aligned with what's important and valuable to you. And I think when I see the most successful investors, like really the most successful, not the people who are very, very good and, you know, pretty well known, but the ones at the absolute top of their game, they're really profoundly aligned with their own idiosyncrasy. You look at someone like a Bill Miller or a Howard Marks or a Charlie Munger, they're deeply aligned with who they are. They've structured their lives in a way where they're doing what they're good at, what they're best at, what they care most about. I, I remember Bill Miller talking about how he doesn't pump his own gas. He doesn't, he had this dog that he really loved, this, um, this bulldog that I think passed away. He'd got a bulldog because um, Ernie Keeney, the, his mentor and friend who had hired him at Lake Mason all those years ago, said to him, well, you know, you need a new dog. And so obviously, if you want a bull market, it should be a bulldog. And so Bill gets this bulldog that he absolutely adored but he didn't really walk the dog. Like I think his sister kind of more or less took care of the dog and he didn't decorate his home. You know, his sister decorated his homes, both in Florida and the outskirts of Baltimore. And again, you can say, well, it's just because he could afford to do this stuff. And that's sort of true. But I think knowing that you want to structure your life in a way that where you're doing the things you're best at and you care most about is really helpful because it may not require a huge amount of money to do that. Yeah, and I just let me think of one quote, which I'm saying as a joke, I'm not directing this at Bill Miller because like, I found that uh, story very interesting. I have all the respect for, for Bill, for sure. I once heard a casino host say to her fellow staff, okay, so all of you remember, rich people are eccentric, poor people are weird. And um, I, I obviously, I, it made me think of this. Again, I, I'm not referring to, to Bill as I'm saying this, but I think it's important for us to remember that, not in the sense of casino is great or what a casino 
boss is saying is the right way to look at life. But I think we as a society and we tend to look at rich people like, oh, that's so cool. They're going their own ways. But then if they don't have money, they're just outcast. And I also think it says something about us more than necessarily the other person we are we're looking at. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the question is, when you look at the things that are really important to you in your life, how much would it actually cost to do them? And in, in many ways, I think what you find is it's not that expensive. I remember Tony Robbins again going through these things and saying, well, so you want to you have a boat or you want to whatever, you know, like structure it in a different way. Like you borrow a boat or you rent something or I'm not expressing this very well, but I think it's a really important idea to look at what it is in the lives of people who seem to have everything that you really crave and clone that. And it's when I look at what the super rich people I write about have, I can't tell you how little I envy the big houses and the planes and stuff like that. The thing that, um, Envy is, is a bad word because, as Charlie Munger says, it's the dumbest of the seven deadly sins because it's not even fun. But when I look at the things that um, I really crave that the multi-billionaires have, it's independence. It's really the ability to live your life in a way that's true to who you are. And so for someone like me, being in control of my time, that's something that I learn from Bill Miller, right? Bill Miller says, I have control over the, the content of my time. And so the other day, for example, I'm friends with Josh Tarasov, who's a really lovely um, young hedge fund manager. Not that young, he's in his 40s, but he looks about 17 from all his clean living. And, um, and Josh introduced me to a really lovely hedge fund manager who I'm going to have come on the show soon. And um, he's a professor at Columbia as well. And he's just a really remarkable guy. And I knew that this was going to be really interesting. And so I took the train into New York City. And then he was across town staying at this really nice hotel. So it probably took me an hour and a half to get there on a really rainy day. And I spent three hours with him just talking over breakfast. And then I went home. And so just to be able to spend sort of six hours in the middle of the week going to meet a stranger who's really interesting and really smart and really thoughtful and really eccentric because he's also very spiritual as well as being incredibly scientific and smart and thoughtful and a really good investor. That's just such a delight for me, not to have to go into an office, not to have to report to anyone, not to have to explain what I'm doing with my time. I had no idea whether it was going to lead to anything. Um, but in fact, it's led to a really nice friendship with a really interesting, really special guy. And he will come on the podcast and he'll share his insights. And that's a really lovely thing. But that to me, the ability to go do things like that, to chat with people who I can learn stuff from and who are decent and who are interesting. That's just, that, that's the absolute core of a good life. The fact that I've come in here to my office here in New York, just north of the city, and I'm chatting with you this morning. Um, that's a really beautiful thing. You know, you're a friend, you're someone I like a great deal. You're someone I've partnered with at work. And we get to chat about life and build our friendship. And that's just, so that to me, that's just a really, the, the, those are really idiosyncratic things that lie at the heart of a good life for me. And so, so again, I just think our, any, anyone who's listening, just ask yourself what's weird and idiosyncratic in your own value system that you're somehow not fulfilling. So i tell you another thing, Stig, that's the, that I realized a few years ago, about three years ago, it was New Year, I think, three, probably, probably four years ago, and I was reading some article about how we were doing everything. This is pre-COVID, but it was about how we were doing everything in a remote way. We had these digital friendships, not uh, in-person friendships. And I was just thinking, I should set up a book club. And I love literature. You know, I spent three years at Oxford just studying English literature. It's, uh, this is a deep part of my soul of what I love and I'm interested in. And so I set up this book club that was just to study great literature, just to read great fiction. And it was pretty much exclusively 
a bunch of writer friends. And so people like Jason Zweig, for example, who is a wonderful columnist at the Wall Street Journal, and my friend Nina Monk, who's a terrific writer, John Gertner, who's an amazing writer who wrote this book, The Idea Factory, and you know several other really extraordinary people. And um, we sit there and we drink wine and we eat dinner cooked by one of the husbands, uh, who's a member of the group as well, who's a brilliant painter and a really interesting guy. And we get to discuss great fiction. And we don't do it that often. We probably do about four books a year. Um, but that's hugely enriching for me in my life. It's enabled me to build friendships, discuss great literature, discuss the themes in great literature that relate to everything else, continue learning. And it includes most of the things I like most in life, like food, books, wine, friendship, conversation in a beautiful setting. And so again, deeply idiosyncratic, but that's really improved my life. William, um, getting to know you has deeply improved my life. And I, will, I, actually, I have almost a section dedicated to getting to know you. Um, and so I, I hope I won't make you blush. Um, yeah. But one thing I admire about you, there are many things, but one thing I would like to highlight is how good you are at connecting with other people. And I remember the first time you and I met in 2015. Uh, I think it was Guy who introduced us back then. It's, what, seven years ago now. So I don't strictly remember, but we got in touch and we were talking about a book that came out at the time called The Great Minds of Investing. But I think what stood out to me even more than the book, even though it's a, it's a wonderful book, is I just remember how present I felt you were. Um, you know, Preston and I, at the time, we, we did have guests on. We also talked to each other about different books. That was more or less what we did in the beginning. But it was very clear to us that uh, whenever we had authors on, we were the 13th interview of 52 or whatever they were doing, right? And like, and it was another one. It was, you know, people were nice. Don't get me wrong. But then there was a check mark, and then we're done with the investors podcast and then on to the next. And um, we knew that you were doing a book launch at the time. And so obviously you were speaking with other people than us, but you really made an effort in being present. And in a way where I want to say that you can't like it. If a person is present, you can't really fake it. Whether it's business or like hanging out with your kids or whatever it is, it, like you can't fake it. Either you're there or you're not there. And, and to, which to me was absolutely wonderful. And for example, just as we were starting recording today and you're saying, oh, just like I've set aside all the time you need to so just let me know. And that was just so wonderful. It, it, again, to compare you with Warren Buffett, I'm going to do that quite a few times here today, uh, William, if I can. But uh, monies have told the same story about meeting Buffett, who clearly is a very busy person, you're clearly a very busy person. But that was what Buffett said whenever you know God and Money spot this that lunch. Like, oh, you know, <laughs> whenever you get sick of me, you you can just you can just send me home. And what a wonderful way of starting a relationship compared to you know we also have guests on who say, uh, I just want to make sure it's only like sixty minutes. You're gonna send it to the compliance team. I'm gonna give you you know a uh, red light coming up where there was five minutes to go, whatever it is, like, it's so interesting how you approach life and how you're present. And it's not that it's more time consuming to be present. If anything, it's probably less time consuming mm. and more efficient. But I'm trying to rope myself into actually asking you a question here because I wanted to ask you, William, because I think this is applicable, not just to us here on our team, but also to our listeners who can use this professionally and personally. All this thing about being present, is that something that comes natural to you? If you ever considered it, or is it something that you were conscious about whenever you, you start a new relationship? How can I be most present? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. That's very kind. I'm a pretty intense person, I, I think. And so I think when I'm in a conversation, I'm really there. I mean, I, I'm not really thinking about anything else. I'm very intensely engaged and I'm looking at the I find this when I'm in an interview, when I do these podcast interviews, for example, you'd be kind of shocked if you knew how stressed I get before some of them, even I mean, before something like my interview with Daniel Goldman, who I'm friends with, I was really, really stressed. And part of the reason is I admire him a great deal and he's older than me and he's sort of a role model and a mentor. And so I guess there was some part of me that wanted to impress him and not disappoint. 
But even when I did my interview with Guy Spear, who's one of my closest friends, I was really nervous before that. So it's kind of strange. And then I get into the interview. And as it starts, as the person comes on, this deep sense of peace descends on me. And actually a kind of joy, to be honest. And I, I think it's because I'm so deeply present in the conversation that it is like a flow state where everything else, all of my anxieties, my worries just disappear and I'm fully there. And so maybe it's a quirk of my wiring that that happens, but I do feel very present. And in the introduction to The Great Minds of Investing, I wrote about my friend, Michael O'Brien, who took the photos for the book. And he's an extraordinary photographer. And I, I was interviewing him about his technique. And he said to me that he would be taking photos of, say, I think he had less time with Buffett than with most, but say Buffett, Munger, Howard Marks, Irving Kahn, all of these extraordinary people. And he'd get very close up and he wouldn't allow them to smile. And he wouldn't speak while he was taking all of these photos. And he said to me, he might take 200, 250 photos of someone quickly without speaking. And he said he would sort of motion if he wanted them to move their chin. And he said, because he was so engaged, they were engaged. And I recognize something in that. When Josh Waitskin, who wrote this great book, The Art of Learning, talks about thematic interconnectedness, where you, I think that's the phrase anyway, where when you find a theme going through one discipline and running through another. So for example, he'd find the parallels in chess and jujitsu and tai chi chuan push hands and investing. And this was one of those moments of thematic interconnectedness where I saw, oh, that's what Michael O'Brien is doing. He's so captivated and so engaged and so present that the person he's photographing mirrors it. And so I think it is a hard thing to fake. Either you're there or you're not, but it helps if you're doing something that's profoundly interesting to you. If I was sitting around reading 10Ks or something like that, I just wouldn't be that interested. It just isn't what excites me. But the opportunity to talk to, I just scheduled another interview with Ray Dalio for a few weeks from now. That scares me. I'm anxious about it. I'm like, what am I going to ask? What, I, how do I prepare? I'm already worrying about it. But I'm going to prepare like crazy. And then again, I think the anxiety will kind of dissipate and I'll just be deeply present there. So some of it, I think, is just doing stuff that you deeply care about and that suits you and that really, truly engages you. But these must be skills you can learn because I remember my friend Ken Schubenstein, who I write about in my book as well, he would talk about, he's a very interesting guy who's now he's stopped being a professional investor and has become a neurologist, a really fascinating guy. And he would pick a topic each year to study. And one year, his topic was learning to listen. I thought that was a really interesting thing that he made it his study for that year that he was going to become a better listener. And he is a re remarkable listener. And so, so I do think these skills must be learnable. You must be able to get better at them. So on that note, William, your network is absolutely amazing. I'm sure everyone who has read Richer, Wiser, Happier, they all been thinking, how do you get access to all of these people? And um, you know, it, not to put words in your mouth, I guess I sort of air just by, by saying that, but it really makes me think of, of Buffett's advice on how to find a good spouse, find good friends. You know, start by being a good spouse or being a good friend. You know, that's step number one. So I would say that you are such a high quality person, which is also why it's no surprise that you were surrounded by high quality people. So perhaps my question is actually different than what I imagine it to be in the sense that can you give advice to the audience about how do you build and invest in relationships with high quality people? I think part of it is knowing that it's hugely important. And so for me, for many years, I neglected my friendships. So I grew up in London and then I moved to New York when I was maybe 20, 21. And so I let a lot of those college relationships sort of wane a little bit. They lost some of their intensity just because I wasn't there. Then I lived in New York. Then I moved to Boston. Then I moved back to New York. 
Then I moved to Hong Kong for five years to work for Time Magazine. And so I built some very strong relationships there. And then I moved to London and then I moved back to New York. And so every time I moved, I would let certain deep relationships wither a little. I would neglect them. And I think partly, partly what happened to me is that by writing my book and really thinking hard about Munga and Buffett and Ed Thorpe and all of these people I was writing about, I started to realize how misguided that had been. And th there was a moment when I asked Munga what we could learn from him and Warren about a happy life. And he just immediately started talking about relationships. There was no segue. He just started talking about how they'd been surrounded by great people. And he said, I've been a good partner to him and he's been a marvelous partner to me. And then talked about that whole idea of if you want to have a good partner, be a good partner. And I just thought about that and I thought, so if I'm going to clone the spirit of this, what sort of a, I'd always thought, well, how come I don't have better friendships? Like I'm a pretty nice person and I'm kind of sociable and I like people. And how come I have so few really good friendships? And then I started to realize, well, because I'm not a really good friend. I'm not really showing up for people. And so the realization the relationships are not a side issue. It's not a distraction while you get ahead with your career. And that, that it sounds so obvious and mundane, but that was a really important thing for me to realize, right? Just to know that it's a priority. And Ed Thorpe, likewise, who, as our listeners know, is not only one of the greatest investors of all time, but one of the greatest gamblers of all time. He's the guy who figured out how to count cards and how to beat the casino at roulette and Blackjack, I mean, a brilliant guy. I said to him when I had this three hour breakfast with him in New York for the book, I said to him, so if you were approaching life as a game, given that you're the most unbelievable game player, how do you stack the odds in your favor to have a successful and happy and truly abundant life? And he said to me this thing that I mentioned in the epilogue of the book, which is he said, who you spend your time with is probably the most important thing of all. And Munga had actually. I think, bought a copy of Ed Thorpe's book for Monish. And he said to Monish, it's a love story. And that's a really interesting insight because Thorpe was married for more than 50 years to a remarkable woman who then passed away and he's since remarried. But it's interesting that Munga saw it as a love story because really it's about markets and this extraordinary life of this game player. And so once I started to think about, okay, so here's Munga, one of the smartest, most rational people on earth talking about the importance of relationships. Here's Ed Thorpe, one of the smartest, most successful. I mean, he's probably the only person in the book who might be brighter than Munga. And again, it's all about relationships. So then I started to think, I've been kind of misguided all these years. I was so busy trying to get ahead. And then I was moving. And my work is kind of, it's very all-consuming. Writing a book, I spent five years on Rich or Wise or Happier, and I'm totally obsessive. And I think of it as being in a tunnel. I sort of neglected everything, with the possible exception of my family, because I was working from home, so I saw a lot of them. But pretty much everything else I was neglecting. I neglected my health. I neglected exercise. It was a really good excuse not to exercise. So I realized how out of whack I got. And so since coming out of that tunnel a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, I started to think, okay, so how do I reboot my life? Not dissimilar to what Guy Spear writes about in The Educational Value Investor, which I helped him with, where he talked about realizing how misaligned he'd become while living in New York, and then he'd moved to Zurich, and he really rebooted his life, restructured his life in a way that was more true to who he was. And so I started to think, okay, if I'm going to realign myself, reboot my life, where have I been going wrong? What have I been not focusing on? So it was clear that I wasn't focusing enough on relationships. It was clear that I wasn't focusing enough on my physical health. So I got a Peloton and it, at the start of the COVID crisis and people constantly mock Peloton and it's got somehow a bad repetition. I can't tell you how life-changing the Peloton has been for me. I, just having it in my laundry room next to my washing machine and my dryer the least elegant. I mean, people make out it some sort of yuppie thing. You know, I did 2,500 miles on the Peloton last year, I think, by wow. 
I called it the, uh, the tour de laundry room. So this is how glamorous it is, but it's made a huge difference to my happiness, my stress levels, my fitness levels. So understanding that health was going to be important was really key. Understanding that equanimity and peace of mind was going to be really key to happy life was a really important part of rebooting my life. So, so knowing that things like meditation are not a digression, but actually are at the core of what you do or prayer or walking in nature or whatever it is that it gives you equanimity, that gives you that kind of emotional resilience. That's really key. I knew that family was really important. So that's just critical. So my mother's in London. I talk to my mother almost every day. I talk to my daughter constantly. I'm seeing my son this Saturday, you know, that sort of thing, knowing that's not a diversion from what's important. Um, and then realizing that friendships are really key has also been a really important part of that rebooting and realigning of my life. And so something like you, you, you and I discussed briefly by email a few weeks ago, I think I said I was heading into the city to have lunch with Bill Brewster, who has a terrific podcast, Business Brew. He's a really lovely guy who I met a few years ago at a Markel brunch in Omaha. And we ended up having lunch there. And then that's led to a friendship where I think I've been on his podcast a couple of times and he was coming into New York. And again, I dropped everything and I took the train in and I saw Bill and I had lunch with him. And I don't know, it was just a really lovely, lovely thing to get to spend time with a very high quality individual like Bill, who's smart and thoughtful and generous spirited and he's honest and truthful and he's working on himself and is sharing. And I don't know, I think in the past, I would have felt really guilty about that and would have thought, what a waste of time for me not to be working. And because, as I said before, I have a highly developed sense of guilt, I would have felt that it was a distraction. And I now realize that that's <laughs> this, this term that I often think of myself, it's the, the eye of the eye of the bullseye. Uh, relationships, when we look back at the end of a long life, when hopefully a long life, when Munger and Ed Thorpe are looking back in their 80s, in Ed's case, and 90s, in Munger's case, of what constitutes a successful life, relationships are at the center of it. And so that's really had a big effect on me. And so this is one of the great ironies is that when I think about what I've learned from the greatest investors, who are these great money makers, it's not really anything to do with money. The thing that I'm really cloning, I mean, yeah, it's got a lot to do with money. I've cloned a lot of stuff there as well. But in a way, one of the most profound things I'm getting from them is this emphasis on relationships. William, I don't know if you read Adam Grant's book, Givers and Takers. My next question probably doesn't make a lot of sense if you haven't. So I, let me just start by, by asking you that question. I have it and I've dipped into it and I am very familiar with his, um, with his ideas, partly because I've seen his TED Talks and the like. And he was actually coached by some wonderful Israeli speaking coaches who Guy Spear introduced me to. Um, so I paid a lot of attention to Adam Grant's thinking without actually ever having read the whole book. Okay, wonderful. And, and uh, it was actually also Guy Spear who recommended that I read Givers and Takers. So perhaps ah. that, that's no, no coincidence. It's a very interesting book. I, I remember the first time I read it, uh, most of it se just seemed off. Like there was just something that didn't get to me. And I would highly recommend it, if that's also how you feel put it away and then read it again. Because it might be because you are in the state of your life where you're in conflict with yourself. At least that was the case for me. And because a lot of the ideas probably seem off to you, or perhaps they seem off to you, at least they did to me in the beginning, because you know, Grant talks about how he has surveyed 30,000 industry professionals, and he divide them up into three different groups, givers, takers, and matchers. 19% uh, were takers. And so a taker is someone who uh, approached life with, what can you do for me? 25% um, were givers. So they approached life by saying, how can I help you? And then uh, the rest, 56%, were what he defined as matchers, which was more, if you help me, I'll help you. But you have to help me. <laughs> so... Um, and what I'm grand saying is that we're all using all three approaches, but the style that defines you is what you use most often. 
And what he found was that the most successful people were givers, but also some of the least successful people were, were also givers. And he explores why that's the case. And so my question to you, William, is that do you buy into this premise of Adam Grant's uh, givers, matchers, and takers? And how do you reflect on this now, given what we talked about, uh, about being present and building relationships? Like, does that play into the same framework for you? Yeah. Look, I would never dispute anything that Adam Grant says because he's incredibly smart. I remember he was the youngest ever tenured professor at Wharton. And, he, you know, he's a brilliant guy and he's done really serious research. So I think it's well worth studying anything that he's said. But what I'll... I, I'm actually applying a different paradigm here that comes from a great Kabbalist. I spent a lot of time studying Kabbalah, which is this sort of ancient kind of mystical wisdom that I think is incredibly profound. And there was a great sage called Rav Ashlag, Rav Yehuda Ashlag, uh, who's no longer alive, but I read a lot of his books and read them multiple times. And I think this was in a book of his called The Wisdom of Truth, where he provided this framework for how to see the world that is totally related to what Adam Grant's talking about, but that I've just found so incredibly robust. And in a, in an, uh, it's allowed me to kind of simplify the way I view the world. And so what Rav Ashlag said, is that he said, we're all born with what he calls the desire to receive for the self alone, which is me, me, me. It's like a baby with clenched hands screaming and saying, bring me my milk now, you know, and it's just about the ego and how to fill my own desires, the desire to receive for the self alone. And what Rav Ashlag says is that our trajectory basically is to transform that desire to receive for the self alone into what he describes as the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. And so what you're trying to do is gradually work on yourself to a point where you become less filled with a desire to take and more filled with a desire to give, more, more sharing, kinder, more compassionate. And that, that to me, there, there are certain ideas in life that when you encounter them, you just deeply, deeply sense that they're true. And this to me is one of the great insights of life, right? That my, I'm failing constantly to transform my ego. Like there are all of these ways in which I mess up and I do stuff that's selfish, but at least I know that I need to be directionally correct on this front, that the more I become sharing and kinder and have less of an agenda, the better. And there are lots of nuances to this. So Rav Ashlag says this really beautiful thing that I think is incredibly profound, where he uses this Hebrew word lishma, which as I understand my Hebrew is lousy, but as I understand it, it basically means to give pleasure to your creator. And he says that the highest level, he says early on when you're trying to transform your ego and become more sharing, kinder, maybe it's because you're worried that, you know, if you don't, people will dislike you or you'll get punished, or maybe there's an afterlife where you'll get punished. And then gradually you start to transform and you start to taste that it's good and that you're like, oh, this is good. I have better friendships and my life is better and I feel happier about myself and I respect myself more and it starts to feel good. But there's still an agenda. There's still a sense that if I behave well, people will admire me, they'll respect me, maybe I'll make more money because I'll have better partners. And all of that is true. But he says that the highest level is to get to a point where you're just saying, no, I'm just doing this because it gives pleasure to my creator. And that's such a beautiful and strange idea. And I hesitate to share it because it makes me sound like a terrible proselytizer, which I don't mean to be. But I have a friend, a remarkable guy, I haven't seen in a few years, but who's been in Ukraine, helping out in Ukraine recently. And his job basically was to free trafficked women. This is what he's done for decades. He's an absolutely remarkable guy. And I once was going to Actually, it's funny, I was going to Israel to visit the, the sites, the grave sites of, among other things, the grave sites of various great sages, including Rav Ashlag. And one of the things that you do is you ask people, you know, is there something I can meditate for for you while I go to the sites of these extraordinary people? It's all pretty mystical and irrational, but it's a beautiful thing to do. And when I said to this guy, can I meditate on anything for you? He wrote me back and he said, yeah, to understand the meaning of the word lishma which means to give pleasure to your creator. So here's this guy whose job is basically to save people who've been trafficked into slavery, and he's trying to release them at tremendous 
danger to his own life. And that's what he wants to understand. And so for me, the Adam Grant model for how the world works has tremendous relevance because it's related to this idea of giving and taking. But I just connect to Rav Ashlag's model much more deeply. The idea that the more I get out of my own way, the more I drop my agenda, the, the better things are going to work out. And that's, it, it doesn't really come naturally. It, it's hard, right? You go into meetings with an agenda. You think, what am I going to get out of this? Why would I spend my time with this person? Why would I do this project or whatever? But actually at a certain point, I find that when I'm not doing it, thinking of what I'm going to get out of it myself, really beautiful things start to happen. And you start to draw different people into your life who are also, they also don't really have an agenda. And that's a really magical, magical discovery in a way. And I think of Buffett and Munger, right? There's that beautiful line that I often quote from the start of Janet Lowe's book where Buffett wrote a forward and he talks about how in 41 years, I've never seen Charlie try to take advantage of anyone. And he said he knowingly takes the worst side of a deal over and over again. And when something goes wrong, he takes more of the blame than he deserves. And when it goes right, he takes less of the credit. So, so here you look at one of the great relationships, a relationship that's built so much value in the world and taught us all so much about how to live and how to do business and how to think more rationally. And it's built on this fundamental lack of taking, lack of ego. And likewise, look in the chapter that I wrote about Nick Sleep and Kay Sicaria. And Nick talks about how their friendship, their partnership at the Nomad Fund, which had these extraordinary returns, was built on kindness. And he said, they talked to me about how when they were structuring the deal in the first place to be partners at Nomad, in many ways, Nick was the alpha dog. He'd had this incredibly successful run already working for another investment firm. He's kind of this good-looking, dashing, successful guy. And Zach had this job that he hated as an institutional broker, and he was just feeling tortured. And he's shyer and more anxious and brilliant guy and lovely guy. But he's coming in sort of, sort of bruised into this partnership. And Nick says to him, let's go 50-50. So we'll just own the fund totally, totally equally. And Zach says, no, I want you to have 51% of it so that if ever we're in disagreement about anything, you'll be the one who makes the decision. And Nick said to me, when someone hands you a loaded revolver like that and says, here, shoot me if you want, you you look out for them. And there are certain people who would take the loaded revolver and shoot their partner. And maybe there's a danger to that. I mean, Guy said to me, Guy Spear said to me once that when he started to behave this way, he initially attracted a lot of takers and you have to kind of work through that and you figure out who the takers are and who the givers are. I've actually never had that. I, I don't know. I don't know why. I feel like maybe it's that I'm not such a good giver as guy. I don't know. Um, I've been astonished at how generous spirited people are. I'll give you an extraordinary example of this, Stig. There's a lovely woman in Ireland who I've never met in person called Litilita, who before my book came out, wrote to me, I think on my website and said, I'd like to get a signed copy of your book, A Richer, Wiser, Happier. And can you arrange for this to happen? And I started writing back to her. We had these exchanges and it turned out that she had a partner who I think lived in Australia, who was called Henry, which is the same name as my son. And she wanted to send him the book and I arranged to get a signed copy and I sent it to her in Ireland and she got it to Henry and Henry loved the book and they used to read it together multiple times. And she sent me like some wonderful present a couple of years ago. I mean, she paid me for the book and stuff, but it was, a, you know, it's a hassle to do that sort of thing. And I'm kind of incompetent and to get to the post office is actually really hard for me and to do, you know, I'm scattered and doing too many things. But yesterday I come into the house here in New York and there's a big package and it's a box of chocolates with a really lovely note from Lita from, you know, so this is two years later 
that's just such an extraordinary thing. And and I just, when you see people act like that, it's such a beautiful thing. So I just, I find my life is kind of full of people behaving in this really lovely, kind, generous spirited way. I'm not trying to be a Pollyanna. I just, I'm just sort of shocked at how decent people are. So William, you mentioned before, and I'm paraphrasing here, so please forgive me that the quality of your life is how you spend your time and who you spend your time with. I had a conversation with Manish some time ago, and he talked about how he was very deliberate with his time in a different way than Guy, for example, was. That Guy would be meeting up with what Manish would refer to as yo-yos. Oh. And, uh, and so you smile, you, you know what I'm, what I'm referring to. Yeah. So uh, people who uh, reach out to you and say, hey, hey uh, let's have a cup of coffee. Like, no, no set agenda. Um, and I look at, whenever I speak with Munch, whenever I speak with Guy, they, they seem to be very in line with who they are as people. And they also seem to be very deliberate with how they spend the time, but they do spend their time very, very differently. Munch would not meeting up with what he would call yo-yos, whereas, whereas Guy would. And I think perhaps many people in the audience have been floating between those two. At least I can say that, that I have. I've had periods of my life where I've been very deliberate with who I met up with and for how long and what was the reason why we're doing it, but also times where, hmm, let's see what happens. Uh, we're meeting this nice guy, Bill Brewster, at the Markel brunch, and now he's coming to the city, and so now let's drop everything in half so I can meet with that person. And so I kind of feel like both approaches probably resonate with people, but in different ways. So using guidelines who we refer to quite a few times uh, here on, on the episode, also because they're a mutual friend of ours, but they but also because the audience most likely know them. How do you think about those two approaches? And again, in this framework of, of building relationships, living that richer, wiser, happier life. It's striking that they're both acting in ways that are true to their own personality. And I think that's critical, right? So Monish said to me, and I wrote about this in the book, that if he has a dinner with somebody, he'll ask himself afterwards, did I enjoy that dinner? And he's like, if I didn't enjoy that dinner, I will never have another dinner with that person. And again, it goes back to this thing I was saying before about how when you live a life that's really aligned with yourself, it can be really antisocial. I mean, Monish, very truthful. A lot of people would find that really harsh. But another thing that Monish said that's a really important filter for him is he says, is building a relationship with this person going to make me a better or worse person? That's an incredibly helpful filter, but it does also leave out the fact that you also want relationships with people who you can lift up and help. And actually, if you think about it, Monish's entire life really is structured around that, given what he's doing with Dakshina, his foundation, where he's taking thousands of kids who are incredibly smart and deserving and often from really poor, underprivileged families around India. And he's lifting them out of poverty and giving them the opportunity to take the entrance exam to the Indian Institutes of Technology and to medical school. And so I think in some ways, Monish, Monish sounds tougher than he is. So he says these things that are true in terms of, yeah, he does ask himself that about when he's having a meal with someone. He does ask himself whether the person is going to make him better. But He's much softer, actually, than that makes him seem. There's a generosity of spirit and a kindness to Monish that it's really easy to miss. And it's very striking to me when, if you look at my chapter about Charlie Munger in my book, when I was going to interview Munger, Monish said something to me in advance where he said, he's got a very tough exterior but actually he's got a very soft heart. He's got a huge heart. And he, it, Charlie has been an incredibly nurturing friend and mentor to Monish. And I think that's interesting. I think in some ways, unconsciously, Monish was also talking about himself. I think he's got a tough exterior, but a really big heart, very kind person. And so actually he's structured his life where he's got rid of a lot of yo-yos in terms of his social life and who he's doing business with. And yet he's also lifting up tens of thousands of people at the same time. 
That's a really interesting thing. And look at the number of talks that Monish does, where he goes to talk to universities, to university students. Why is he doing that? It's not for his own ego. I mean, there's an aspect of ego in all of these things, right? Like we, we like people to listen to us and to think we're smart and all of that. Like, I think there's ego to Warren and Charlie, right? They like being in the spotlight in Omaha and having people listen to them and stuff. But at the same time, they're incredibly sharing with their wisdom and their insight. It's just incredible. And so I don't think any of us are sort of these saintly figures who are just pure of heart with no agenda and no ego. But directionally, you look at people like Warren, Charlie, Monish, Howard Marks, Joel Greenblatt, Guy, they're spending an enormous amount of their time sharing their insights and what they've learned to lift up other people. So I think, um, yeah, you want to Try not to spend too much of your time with yo-yos who are going to make you a worse person. But at the same time, the ability to lift up other people and help other people and pass on what you've figured out and to support other people, that's an incredible gift in life. And I, so I actually think um, Monish is doing that the whole time. And I think for Guy, Guy is more obviously soft on the exterior guy is constantly trying to help people and lift people up so guy creates a lot of complexity in his life because he's allowed so many people in and that's difficult and i this is something i wrestle with the whole time because i try to reply to people when they write to me and it's really hard and i have this sense that i'm constantly dropping the ball and someone will write me a really kind message and i have this vague sense that i've not reply to lots of people. And there are certain people who've told me that my book or a podcast episode or something has changed their life. And it's really touching and really lovely. And then you have this general sense that, you know, if there are 20 balls that you're juggling, you've dropped like seven of them. And so, so that's a problem that as you open yourself up more to trying to help more people, trying to talk to more people, trying to be kind to more people, you create additional complexity in your life. And that's a, that makes it very difficult to focus and do deep work. I think that's a real problem. There's a real, there's a real tension here. And once in a while I start to realize I've become out of whack, misaligned. And I'm like, no, I've got to simplify my life. And in, in that chapter about manga, where I also write about Ken Schubenstein, who I mentioned before, my friend who became the neurologist. One thing that Ken said to me that's had a really profound impact on me is that he said when his life starts to get really complex and he starts to get really stressed and things are difficult, for example, during the financial crisis or other periods of his life that have been challenging, he really simplified and he would go through his calendar and he'd cancel all sorts of meetings. He'd try to reduce complexity and he would get back to four basic things that he knows are good for his brain and his ability to think. And those are exercise, good nutrition, meditation, and good sleep. And that's very clarifying when you have a super rational hedge fund manager with a background in brain science, who'd also been teaching the advanced investment research course at, for 10 years at Columbia. This is Ken Schubenstein saying to you, These are the four things that we know scientifically help you to think well. So when you're getting overwhelmed and when there's too much complexity in your life because you're letting too many people in, too many things, too many responsibilities, get back to this kind of simplicity. That's very helpful. And the last few days, my eye has been twitching like crazy and I don't really know why, but I have this sense where I'm just juggling too many things, too much stuff. And I have this fear that I'm messing up on some front. And that's sort of my body telling me that I've got to simplify a little bit. I've got to calm down. I've got to streamline. I've got to get back to those basic things like exercise, meditation, not too many assignments, not too many responsibilities. It's a long-winded answer to your question, but I think it gets at some of the complexity and nuance of this problem that, yeah, you want to, you want to be helping people. Yeah, you want to let more and more people into your life. Yeah, relationships are the most important thing. But also, if there's too much complexity in your life, 
um, things start to go haywire and you start to get misaligned. And so I think if there's a takeaway, our listeners should really be thinking about what are the few absolutely core things that you don't want to neglect. And so for me, just knowing the fact that I need to do things like meditation or prayer or whatever, that's going to help with my equanimity, but I need to do exercise much as I love any excuse not to exercise that I, I need to spend time with my family, that it given a choice between relationships with strangers who write to me or with friends who I like, who are in town, but who I don't see very much. If I'm going to have to neglect anyone, it, there are these concentric circles, I guess. And the, the consent, the, the inner circle of your wife, your kids, or your closest friends or your parents or whatever, that's the eye of the eye of the bullseye. So at least knowing that once in a while you have to pull up the drawbridge a bit and say, no, I'm getting away from the core task because otherwise you start to go a little bit crazy. And I, I feel that a little bit at the moment. I don't know if you find this stig where just the fact that the podcast comes up every couple of weeks, like there's this constant pressure to find guests, to prepare, to edit. And then if you're juggling other stuff, I mean, you, you know, you're running the business as well, which is incredibly time consuming. Um, and so you have the complexity of the stuff. I, I just, so it's real. It's, it's a real challenge to get the right balance where you're developing deep friendships and the like you're helping other people, but you're not driving yourself absolutely bonkers. So William, this has been absolutely amazing. As you know, and perhaps the listener do not know, I prepared nine questions for this interview and we went through three. Uh, <laughs> and so we've been covering a lot of ground. Most of the questions weren't really prepared. Uh, who knows? It probably gives us a more organic and nicer conversation, but I, I can definitely say for myself, I would love doing this type of of interviews again let's put it out there see if the audience like this type of conversation and whether we should do this type of riffing again and let's see where it takes us um i don't know i, I might be presumptuous there uh what do you think william i'm always delighted to come chat with you stig and it's just fun that it gives us an opportunity to do our internal work aloud right we're both wrestling with these questions of how do you have a successful life how do you um, how do you deal with the complexity of all of these relationships? How do you balance being able to focus on your deep work that you have to do with trying to help strangers and be available to strangers and be a better friend and deal with family? And so I, I feel like um, we're wrestling with very similar problems and they're very nuanced. And it's fun to be able to talk them through and to articulate stuff. And so yeah, I love the opportunity to chat with about these things and about what we're learning along the way. I, ha I have a great friend, a guy called Matt Ludmer, who I, I, I work in a shared office space. And he's a very remarkable guy. And um, he's a very serious student of Buddhism. And he talked to me at one point about this phrase, friends along the path. And I love that idea that we're all, we're friends along this path. And it's not like we're sages who figured everything out. We're actually trying to wrestle with these issues of, yeah, what, what should we learn from Munger and Buffett? What do we want to clone? Is there, you know, is Monish's approach better than Guy's or actually are they doing the same thing? And so yeah, it's a really wonderful thing to be able to talk about these things with you. And I, and more than anything, I, I really wanted to thank you as well for being such a good friend and partner and friend along the path, because it, it's just been a real joy to get to know you over these years and to get to spend time with you. And uh, you know, you've been very flattering to me during this conversation. I really appreciate it. And I, I know, I think you may underestimate what an extraordinary human you are. And it's just been, it's been great to get to know you and it's fun to be a friend along the path with you. Well, thank you for saying so. It's always great speaking with you, William. Thank you so much for saying so. It's been a real pleasure. Hope to see you again soon. Likewise. And maybe it's just because we don't understand it so well, but if we don't understand the rationale behind the investment, we're not as comfortable with it.